Well, hi everyone, and welcome to lecture 15 of Physics 3113. This will be the last lecture of this term, um, and technically, I look, according to the syllabus, we were going to revisit the ideal gas. And I had a look at that, and uh, given that um, the last few lectures have had a lot of material, quite dense material, I think we can skip the revisiting the ideal gas. Um, at this point, uh, also given the situation, I don't want to throw another in-depth topic at you. And essentially, it's, it's kind of interesting historically because uh, it just we wanted to show that using the kind of microscopic description and statistical mechanics that we've learned about fermions and bosons and so forth, uh, and as we also discussed, this idea of the classical limit, uh, we would just show that you get the results of the ideal gas. So it's kind of interesting, but I think um, in the context of what we've covered already and for what you need for your next course, it's kind of, it's not absolutely necessary to cover, and so we'll just skip that, and this will be the last lecture. There will be, however, a tutorial on the material that uh, we've covered um, since the assignment went out, and that will be on Friday. Also, Harry, who does the tutorials, will be uh, hosting an online exam review revision session uh, about five or six days um, before the final exam, and he'll get back to you on exactly the details of that. So, okay, so in this lecture and the last topic we'll have for the course, we're going to discuss um, lattice vibrations, in, which are known as phonons, uh, and um, how they affect the specific heat of solids. Now, this was a really interesting problem in the early 20th century because there, were, uh, there was a classical uh, result for the specific heat um, of solids, and that worked very well at uh, high temperatures, at room temperature, for example. But at low temperatures, it didn't work very well. And so Einstein uh, came along um, and had a very simple idea uh, about um, lattice vibrations as oscillators. And because of oscillators were quantized, and he actually showed uh, that he could explain some of the results and resolve uh, this sort of discrepancy. In, in a sort of simple way, and it was kind of a triumph of quantum mechanics, uh, this idea of using oscillators and particular quantum mechanics, oscillators, quantum mechanics that we've already uh, discussed in terms of um, understanding the specific heat of solids. So we'll just go over Einstein model and then uh, we'll show that a better approximation or a better, better model for that is the Debye model and then we'll look at how those compare at low temperatures. And we'll see a lot of this is, is very much like uh, what we saw with pho photons and black body radiation. There's just some subtle and important differences that we'll point out. Okay, so here we go. When one looks at the specific heat of solids, and especially at low temperatures, um, it's found that the main contribution to specific heat is due to lattice vibrations, otherwise known as phonons. So how does that work? Well, in a solid, of course, atoms are free to vibrate around their equilibrium positions. And you know, so you know, each atom is specified by three position coordinates and three momentum coordinates. And otherwise, it, you know, each atom behaves like uh, a harmonic oscillator that has three degrees of freedom. Now, since vibrations are assumed to be small, then the potential energy can be expanded around the equilibrium positions, and therefore the potential energy can be taken to be quadratic in the atomic displacements, and that, of course, gives us a harmonic oscillator as we've studied previously. So the net result is the total energy of lattice vibrations can be written in terms of normal modes. Uh, so, for example, for a large number of, of atoms in a solid, let's, let's just take that to be Avogadro's number, uh, in sub A, uh, then we could write down the energy or the Hamiltonian if you like. It would be a sum over uh, three uh, NA oscillators and it would have this form. And here um, I have the mass of the atom. I'm, I'm considering a elemental solid for simplicity so that there's only one type of atom. It has mass M 
And um, these kappas, I, I use kappa instead of k just so we don't get confused with Boltzmann's constant. The the spring, these are the spring constants of um, all the oscillators. Now, what, this is the actual description of a solid, and I mentioned the idea of normal modes. And of course, you've probably studied this when you had coupled oscillators. We can think of all the atoms uh, are oscillators, but of course they're coupled to their nearest neighbors and so forth. And uh, and by working in normal modes, we would actually um, work in the 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 uh, sort of the eigen modes of this system. So you know, if you couple a bunch of oscillators, um, you get eigen modes, which are superpositions of those oscillators, and and you can treat those as being independent and uncoupled. So in terms of normal modes, the, this energy is, is, is equivalent to you know, 3 times Na independent oscillators, if we use the normal modes. And as I said, normal modes result from a system of coupled oscillators. So if I have a system of coupled oscillators, I make this linear transformation and I get, um, I get normal modes. And, and you can always write down their energy as if they're sort of independent oscillators. This is just the general property of coupled oscillators, coupled harmonic oscillators. So let's say we could do that. Then according to the equipartition theorem, uh, which of course is classical and as we've seen works at large enough temperature, we could then easily write down what we would expect for the mean energy of the, this large number of oscillators. It would be um, three uh, times Avogadro numbers, because that's how many oscillators have, times each oscillator has two degrees of freedom, as we saw previously in the lectures, and, um, and each one of those gets half a kBT for the average energy, that's according to equipartition. So we'd get three N sub A kBT um, um, as the average, uh, or sort of mean energy per mole, because uh, we assumed a mole here, and of course that's 3RT if we write uh, the R is uh, Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann constant. And then of course the specific heat, we would take the derivative and it would just be 3R, right? And if you put in the number for the this gas constant R, uh, R, which is, as you know, is uh, Avogadro's number times Boltzmann's constant, just put in the numbers, you get about 25 joules per mole per degree Kelvin. And this um, specific heat of solids uh, and this particular value and this uh, appeal to equipartition theorem is historically known as the law of Dulong and Petit. And these are the guys who came up with it. And it's actually interesting because what they uh, showed with this is that um, that you could use this uh, to, uh, you could use heat capacity measurements to get the atomic number. Because you'd have a mass of something, and you'd have to figure out um, the, the atomic number to get the number of uh, moles. So, you know, that's a kind of that doesn't say anything about what kind of material it is. So that's just uh, a number uh, that you should have um, according to the equipartition theorem, of which we, as we've seen, works at large enough temperature. And here's a table of the um, heat capacity. Now, this is from a textbook called Rife, which is a really old classic textbook on statistical physics. Um, and this table is actually uh, um, the heat capacity at constant, a specific heat at constant pressure. Um, and in solids, that's actually not much different than uh, the heat capacity at constant volume. Uh, it, of course, it's very different in a gas, but in, in, a, in a solid, it's only... Um, the C sub V is only about 5% lower CP. So um, uh, let's just look at the numbers here. And you can see for all the solids, for most of the solids, um, um, CV will be a, bit low, a little bit lower than this, but it'll be just about this value of 25 here. Uh, and that's, of course, what Dulong and Petit observed, and they explained uh, by this equipartition theorem. Now, um, so Dulong and Petit's law works okay for solids at room temperature, except, for example, if we look here for a diamond, it doesn't work. In fact, you might want to think about why that is after this lecture.
Well, and so the the discrepancy came though when people started looking at the heat capacity, specific heat at um, at low temperatures, and so Dulong and Petit's law just it gives this temperature independent result as we had here, right? There's no temperature dependence there. And uh, what it was found around the uh, turn of the uh, 20th century, around the you know 1900, was that this law didn't work well at low temperatures, and no one really could explain this very well. Uh, but as we know from what we've studied so far, and our look at oscillators, we realize that this should be expected to fail at low temperatures, and sure enough. It was observed experimentally that the specific heat went to zero at low temperatures. Um, and, and of course, that's what happens with an, a single oscillator. If you look back at our notes on oscillators, the specific heat goes to zero at low temperatures. So, so uh, this was a bit of a discrepancy. And then Einstein came along in 1906, and he said, um, well, let's, let's suppose all these uh, these oscillators that represent the vibrations of the lattice vibrations of the solid are actually quantum mechanical because by then he had a good understanding of uh, the quantum mechanics of the harmonic oscillator and that that uh, from his studies of black body radiation and so and he said let's just assume they're oscillators and they're they behave according to quantum mechanics so they have quantized energy levels and he said, let's just make a really crude assumption that all of the atoms in the solid vibrate at the same frequency. So this is essentially assuming a system of uncoupled oscillators, all with the same spring constant and mass, and hence the same frequency. Now, even Einstein knew that this was a very crude approximation, but he realized that to try to calculate for any given solid, to try to actually calculate the normal modes and the normal frequencies would be a rather complex problem and so and he just wanted to get the basic idea across he wanted to explain why they the heat capacity went to zero at, at uh, low temperatures and so he made this really simple sort of approximation that's known as the Einstein model and we'll see that this explains a couple of things so it resolves this this discrepancy of that Dulong and Petit's laws don't work at low temperatures and it attributes that to the fact that oscillators are quantized. And we'll see that you can improve on this greatly, and that that's, will be our next topic when we come to the so-called Debye approximation, or Debye model. But uh, and the Debye model is an approximation to actually going and solving the normal modes. But we'll come back to that in a few slides. Let's see what we get from Einstein's model. That we have all these oscillators, that the atoms are oscillators, we have a large, we have three end of those oscillators and they all have the same spring constant and mass and frequency. Well then with Einstein's model it's quite easy to find the mean energy because we already you know essentially we're assuming that we have a large number of identical oscillators and we we worked out the results for a single oscillator and we we realized how to work out results when we have a large number in of identical systems and so um, if we use what we found in the past lectures, we would find the mean energy is in a, we considered n sub a uh, oscillator. So we have a solid that's a mole of some solid. Then we would get three n h bar omega times uh, this function here that we encountered when we discuss when we di when we um, discuss the harmonic oscillator and then black body radiation. So. Uh, And so, of course, we we would we could just from this find the uh, specific heat by taking the derivative, and we get this result. And if you look at that result, you'll see that uh, if you expand at high temperature, you'll see you'll get ex exactly the uh, Dulong Petit law. But let's just uh, rewrite this uh, by uh, defining the so-called Einstein temperature. Uh, in terms of the uh, h bar omega, the energy of of this uh, of an oscillator. So then we can write this. It's just just substitution here, and 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 we write this uh, in this form. And so we can see at high temperatures that was that is when this theta Einstein, which is the so-called Einstein temperature, 
over the, the temperature is much, much less than one, so that's the high temperature limit. We can see that the specific heat per mole is just 3R, and that's the law of Dulong and Petit. Um, but for low temperatures, uh, basically uh, this term becomes large, and so the, the, the one here is irrelevant, and we square that, and we just end up with e to the minus theta sub e divided by t here, and the same prefactor. And we get this, and you can see, um, well, this is like a power law, and this is like an exponential, and so in the end, this goes like an exponential at low temperature. So it goes to zero at low temperature, which you can see by looking at this expression. So, so, so just a side comment, when you have something like, a, so this is a power law, of course, this term's getting big as temperature goes low, uh, but in the, this term, the, exp, the, the exponential of some large number, which is theta e over t, which when t goes low, is getting really, really tiny, and when you have a power law times an exponential, and this factor is getting big and this one's getting small, then the exponential always wins. You can just see that by plotting this if you like. And we'll plot this, actually we'll plot this uh, at the end of this lecture when we compare some things. So anyway, so, the, so you know, it was pretty nice. Einstein basically came up with a very crude and simple assumption and showed that he could explain the specific heat at low temperatures on the basis of uh, quantum mechanics or more precisely that the oscillators, the energy levels of the oscillators were quantized. So it was actually a really interesting uh, result. Well, as I said, even Einstein knew that uh, that was a really crude approximation, but it, it got at the basic idea of what was happening. Um, and it wasn't long, actually. Um, so Einstein's model was, I believe, 1906. And it was only, you know, less, it was only six years later that Debye um, was able to uh, generalize Einstein's model uh, and... Um, and show that uh, you could go beyond this crude estimate and, and give a really um, very uh, precise uh, result for the specific heat at low temperatures and one that was actually observed experimentally. So Einstein approximation showed, as I said, that this goes exponentially to zero at low temperatures and that's not what is observed uh, specifically in uh, experiments. And But Debye came up with uh, another model at, that also involves oscillators, we'll go through that, that actually um, agrees with the experiments in low temperatures. So let's go through the, uh, yeah, so we'll go through the Debye model. It's a really smart way to do better than the Einstein model, and it relies on another approximation, uh, and this approximation involves the sort of sound velocity uh, in a solid, and it's called the Debye approximation, or Debye model. So let me just say, I mean, as Einstein realized, and, and I pointed out at the beginning of the lectures, I, you know, you could give me a particular solid, and if I knew the crystal structure of that, I could work out some, some calculation and actually calculate the normal modes. And once, of course, we have the normal modes, and we know that the oscillators are quantized according to the quantum mechanics, then we could really work out the very precise uh, specific heat that you know, fits per that particular solid. But what Debye showed was there was a kind of uh, very interesting uh, way to, that works very, very well to do that without having to calculate all the normal modes, you know, all the, the, the details, uh, minute details of the no lattice vibrations in the normal modes, and it only depends upon the sound velocity. So we'll discuss that, uh, the Debye approximation. It's, it's very useful and you encounter it a lot in physics. So in the Debye approximation, uh, and it, it's, it's really something like a phonon version of black body radiation. So instead of say, assuming like Einstein model that the frequency, the oscillator frequency is the same for all the oscillators, one actually derives a density of states, essentially of modes. And, and we did that for uh, black body radiation, if you remember, so that uh, we don't just have a... a in identical oscillators, we have a range of oscillators, and and and, and Debye was able to derive this. And if you see, this actually looks very, very much like um, the density of the states we had for black body radiation. 
Well, except there's a factor of three here. And, and the, instead of the speed of light, this is the, the sound velocity, effective sound velocity in a, a, solid, in a solid. And by the way, you, uh, you probably can guess at this point why you get the factor of three. Um, if you want to pause the lecture and think about that a little bit and see if you know why that is, then why don't you do that now? Um, we'll come back to this, of course, uh, later in the lecture. It's pretty obvious, but it'd be, if you want to test your understanding, you might try to guess why that is at this point. Okay, well, so this looks very much like the black body radiation problem, except we have speed of sound here, we have a factor three there. Um, but uh, unlike the black body problem, we will have to integrate only up to some maximum cutoff frequency that we'll call omega Debye for the Debye frequency. So let me remind you, in black body radiation, we took the integral to infinity because we just had no constraint on um, the, the modes that were there. And, and what it comes down to really is, if you remember, we said that with photons, there's no constraint on, on the number of photons. There's also no constraint on the number of modes um, in an electromagnetic mo mode. There's nothing in a, in a cavity. You, know, you have electromagnetic modes or photons, and there's nothing to tell us uh, that we have some sort of uh, largest frequency or some, some smallest wavelength, that is. Right? So electromagnetic uh, radiation, the modes that represent radi electromagnetic radiation, just keep going as far as we know, up to, um, you know, uh, infinity in terms of frequency, or they just get, you know, infinitely small in terms of wavelength. But with um, phonons or lattice vibrations, we know that there's a smallest wavelength, um, and, and that corresponds to a, 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 a maximum frequency. And that wavelength, of course, is just the lattice spacing. You know, we can't have a oscillation wavelength that's smaller than the distance between atoms because there's nothing there to oscillate, right? That's, that has wavelength, wavelength smaller than the, the lattice constant or the, the distance between atoms. So that's, that's what's related. So, so, so we know that it's got to be a maximum frequency, a cutoff frequency, which corresponds to a cutoff wavelength of order of the lattice spacing. And, um, and then you might want to ask, well, how do, how do we find what that is? And, and what will turn out is we do have, uh, even with this Debye approximation, we know that we, in the end, um, we know how many modes we have to have. It's, if we have a mole of a solid, then it's three times Avogadro's number, and that's, that's how many total modes we have. So essentially, when we integrate over this density of states, we'll have a constraint. Uh, we'll, we'll have to constrain, we'll have to take the integral the total number of modes to equal three times uh, the number of, of atoms we have there that we're considering, and that will actually fix this cutoff frequency. So it's, it's very similar to the way we constrained in, in other problems, and we argued we didn't have to do that um, for um, phono, photons in, in the black body problem. We'll see how that works, actually. Okay, so... So one more time, I just want to say that we, in principle, we could calculate the precise normal mode distribution. That is, we could actually take a specific solid, a particular solid, know if we knew its lattice structure, and we could sort of estimate then, uh, given the lattice structure, the coupling between the atoms, and uh, we could actually calculate the normal mode distribution, uh, sigma of omega. The, the real one, and I'll, sh we'll sh I'll show you an example of that in the next slide or two. Um, and that's a very complicated problem. You know, you can spend a lot of computer time doing that. And uh, I guess back in the early 20th century, that was hard. But um, the nice thing about the Debye approximation is you, it kind of skips that, and it gives the results that uh, that are are actually what's observed. And um, it's very useful in terms of uh, other problems as well. So it's a good thing to learn. So Debye approximation sort of kind of, you know, Debye said, well, let's just forget about the discreteness of the lattice, except for the fact that we know that there's a, a minimum wavelength for our vibrations that we argue that's on order of the lattice spacing. And so he said, let's just treat 
the solid as some sort of elastic medium. And so there's this theory of elasticity um, you might encounter if you do some engineering uh, that explains like an elastic solid. And uh, that basically gives, you can calculate the, the mode spectrum from that. So each, each mode, uh, of course, in this approximation is characterized by some wavelength lambda. And um, uh, for lambda greater than the lattice constant, then discreteness of the lattice really doesn't matter anyway, right? If I, if I, I have, so, so in a solid, you know, if I look at a vibrating solid, what would I see? I would see the atoms vibrating, um, um, and, and it's like it's like when you have your coupled oscillator. If you did the experiment in higher your lab, or you looked at another course, you have the mode which is the out of phase mode, where the where, which is very fast. And then if but if you have uh, an, another mode where the the oscillators are going together, then that's a bit slower uh, in that uh, the period's longer. And if you looked at a whole bunch of atoms, you would see sort of collective oscillations of of a whole bunch of them, at, which it means very long wavelength and much much less a smaller frequency of course if you can imagine that but so when this wavelength is much greater than the lattice constant then but really discreteness of the lattice is not that important and that's what the insight that Debye had um, of course we would expect this approximation to break down when the wavelength uh, got of order of the lattice constant but um, so um, the point is, unlike this continuous elastic media, medium, uh, this solid lattice does have a minimum wavelength, of, as we've argued, that should be the lattice constant. And that means it has a maximum mode frequency. Um, so, you know, we're going to assume, we're going to come up with some sort of density of states, but we know it has to go to zero at some, above some maximum frequency. So, let's suppose we have this isotropic elastic medium. So, that, this is another thing. In, a, in, a me, in an elastic medium, you could have different, uh, um, um, the, the frequencies could be different depending on direction that is on the wave vector, but we're going to assume it's elastic and isotropic. And so then if we have some a local displacement at some point in the medium, this we'll call it u, it depends upon r and time t, location and time, then it, it must satisfy some wave equation that describes propagation of sound waves and they travel with velocity uh, c sub s, the speed of sound. We're going to use c here for, for speed of, uh, and c sub s, c, just c is speed of light, of course, we'll, we'll just use c sub s for the speed of sound. And so this means uh, the analysis of in this approximation of the normal modes is going to be very much like our example of modes in a 3D box. And, and so if you go back to that for photons, you'll see we expressed the angular frequency uh, in terms of the wave vector. And of course, it was just this, the speed times the wave vector. Here we just have the speed of sound. Uh, in an anisotropic medium, this would depend on the direction of k. But here it's isotropic, so uh, it doesn't depend on direction. So in, in this case, we just take all the results we have had from um, when we derived, uh, very, in the very beginning, when we derived density of states, and we had allowed values of k, and we got the distribution, uh, the density of states in terms of wave vector. And here, again, it's just a simple linear transformation. Uh, and so here's what we had in wave vector, and we just do this linear transformation, of course. And uh, I just realized there's another equation here that I'll have to fix and pull up again. Okay, so I just made a new new page for this. So um, yeah, so um, basically we use the same result. We start with the density of states for allowed uh, wave vector, um, and uh, that's what we got. The only difference is the factor three um, accounts for the fact that there are three possible directions of vibrational polarizations: two, two transverse and one longitudinal. I mean. As we said before, the, the, it's a three-dimensional solid, and so each atom can vibrate in three different directions, and that's why the factor of three here. And we just change variables here, it's really simple, to omega, um, and it introduces the speed of sound here. So this is our density of states, then, uh, here. And I guess I'll put sigma, I'm using sigma instead of g here, because that's usually...
what's used in discussions of uh, phonons and I put a subscript C here to remind me that it depends upon this 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 speed uh, speed of sound here but okay so so now that we have this we can use all the tools um, we used before but where there's just one thing left out right we so so to be specific then the the by approximation consists in proximating the actual mode distribution which is hard to calculate by this uh, sigma sub c uh, which is for an elastic medium um, and and so so this this approximation doesn't just work I just want to call it not just for small frequency but it, it, we're going to use this for all frequencies uh, just so but we have to uh, only make sure we include um, the three n lowest frequency modes of this elastic continuum that we're using to model our system because we only have this many modes and so so the Debye approximation to, to be specific uh, says that this density of states we'll call it uh, in terms of so this sigma sub c is for an elastic medium and we'll use a subscript d for a Debye we're just going to use this result for elastic medium but only up to some maximum frequency called the Debye frequency omega sub d and we'll choose this frequency uh, so that when we integrate up the total number of modes, we've got to get 3 in, if, if that's what we want. And we usually think of in here as being Avogadro's number, so we get, we calculate specific, molar specific heats, for example, but at this point it's just, we have this many atoms, so we've got to choose a Debye frequency, so when we integrate over the density of states, so just an integral over the density of states is the total number of modes, right? So in other words, um, we want this integral, which is effectively only up to the Debye frequency, the density of states of the elastic continuum that we're using to approximate, where we, we, need, we need that to equal 3n. So let's just put in this expression that we had on the last page, uh, this expression here, right here, and let's do that integral. So, of course, um, that's an easy integral to do, it's just to make a squared, and of course you could solve that, and you can find then that the Debye frequency, which is fixed by the total number of modes, which is the number of atoms we have, that we're interested in. Um, and you'll see that if you rearrange it, you'll see it just, just depends upon the speed of sound and the, the number density here. So that's it. And now with this approximation, we'll see what we can we can get. Um, and you'll see that this uh, that uh, this Debye frequency is um, is such that the corresponding wavelength would be, of course, of order the at atomic spacing, which is roughly the volume divided by the number to the one third power. Is approximately there. Of course, there's a little factor here. It's not a big deal. This to the third power. And that's what we expected, so it seems like we're on the right track. Um, and if we, now, if we put in numbers, by the way, typical uh, sound velocity in a solid, which is something like 5 times 10 to the 5 centimeters per second, um, and uh, A, which is a typical um, um, lattice constant of, let's say, 100 angstroms, 10 nanometers, then we'll find that this Debye frequency, we put it in frequency, you know, it's divided by 2 pi, it's of the order of 10 terahertz, which is infrared. And so, um, so let's just, just as in terms of comparison, this graph, which also comes from Rife, uh, shows the, what the, essentially what the Debye approximation is doing. Um, and when you compare that to a real mode distribution that you would calculate through a very complex calculation. So if you look here in this plot, um, here's this sigma sub omega density of states, and here is the frequency, the angular frequency. And so uh, essentially the Debye frequency is giving the square dependence up to some cutoff, 
And uh, here's what an actual calculation gives you this complicated thing. And so uh, this curve is actually uh, uh, a measurement uh, for al aluminum, actually, this, this solid line curve. So, you know, it looks like it's pretty rough, but the important thing at low temperatures is going to be the dependence here. And, or sorry, a low the, yeah, the important thing at low temperatures is going to be the, the long wavelength behavior. And you can see it's very good down at um, small frequency, large wavelength, as we argued before. So then we can look at the heat capacity uh, within this Debye approximation. Once again, we have the mean energy, sum over the density of states, times this uh, mean occupation number, which we saw before was like for bosons, except the chemical potential is zero. This is also for pho what we found for photons. And uh, once we find that, we can find the specific heat by taking the derivative of the mean energy with respect to temperature, holding the volume fixed. And if we want, we could write this in terms of a derivative with respect to beta, just by using uh, the chain rule here, essentially, and writing that all out, uh, we can write the um, specific heat, um, w which is easy in terms of the derivative with respect to temperature, but let's just write it with respect to beta, and just using a little bit of algebra here, we'll find that uh, it's this is Boltzmann's constant, K times beta squared times the derivative of the mean energy with respect to beta. Maybe that's a little bit, I just put that here because it's an easier form uh, sometimes, if, especially if we have um, results in terms of beta instead of temperature. So, so then we can see that the specific heat um, is basically Boltzmann's constant. And I apologize, I left out the B again sometimes as I do. I got lazy, um, but I know it's Boltzmann's constant. Um, uh, and we get this expression. So we still have this integral we have to do. Um, and well, we can do that in different limits, but let's, let's just make a quick estimate of the behavior at low temperature. So, well, at low temperature, as always, we have beta times h bar omega is much, much greater than one. Uh, that's low temperature when this, this exponent uh, here is, is large. Um, because beta is 1 over kBt, and t going to getting small means this gets large, and we want this to be a dimensionless constant so we can evaluate it. And uh, then we see this, this, this uh, factor here, these, uh, this product of exponential factors. Um, this is going to get really large, so it's going to uh, be much larger than the 1. And if we square that and then simplify it, we'll just get e to the minus beta h bar omega. And, um, and so this factor, so you imagine at, at uh, low temperatures, this factor is going to be just this exponential, which means it's going to only strongly weight the v values of this integral at, uh, at um, very, very low frequencies or large wavelength. That's exactly what we're saying. So yeah, so this factor, you can see this has an exponential cutoff um, at, um, and so it weights that whole integral to um, low frequencies. And then, you know, of course, uh, essentially what that means, when we, by the time we get up to the Debye frequency, this, this factor is going to be negligible. So uh, in this limit, we can do this calculation just by taking the upper limit, which is the Debye frequency, let's, we can just take that to go to infinity at this point to get the low temperature behavior because of this factor. And in this case, I'm not going to do it, but you can see what you would get is uh, precisely the same median energy you'd get for um, um, black body. That is, you'd get uh, the mean energy goes like t to the fourth, and so the specific heat would go like t to the three. So that's just you know getting a quick estimate. Um, of the low temperature behavior. So um, unlike uh, Einstein model, this goes to zero like a power law. And that is exactly what was observed experimentally. Um, and uh, that actually is the main result of the Debye model or Debye approximation as it's called. So let's look a bit, uh, let's look in detail, uh, more in detail about that. So um,
We saw that uh, we go back to this equation here. Let's just write it again. We found that the heat capacity was Boltzmann's constant uh, beta squared times this integral. And um, we can just plug in the, the density of states we found here and, and, and bring out the constants. And we have, of course, this. And um, as we always do when we have these type of integrals we've seen before with fermions and bosons, let's um, define this dimensionless variable x. x is beta times h bar omega. So it's dimensionless. It's h bar omega, h bar omega over kt. And that just allows us to write um, this um, in terms of a uh, integral over a dimensionless variable up to some cutoff, which is of course also dimensionless. And um, and if you recall, we already found what the Debye frequency was. Um, what was it? Well, here it was. Uh, we we based upon the constraint we needed for um, three n modes. We had this for the Debye constant. So. So uh, let's just um, write this prefactor by, by taking out the volume, and then we'll have um, uh, the Debye factor inside this constant. And if we do that, then, um, then we'll see we'll eliminate the volume here, and we'll just get the specific heat in this form. Uh, and actually, we can, we can get it in this form, as you see, because the volume has n. And when we substitute this in, We'll get something like three three n k, uh, three n times Boltzmann's constant, which is starting to look like the law of Dulong and Petit, right? The, so, and here we've done that. So we can pull out the three n k, and this is what we're left with, and um, we'll see that what is commonly done is then to call this whole thing in brackets here, this. Debye function f sub d, and so so divide, it's a Debye function evaluated at the Debye temperature divided by t. Debye temperature just defined by this relation as we did with the Einstein temperature, and then we define the Debye function as a function of this dimensionless variable in terms of this integral, and so you see that this is a definite integral. So this Debye function is just going to be some number, some that depends upon the argument y here. So that's how it's commonly written. And the reason, of course, is to make explicit the fact that at high temperatures, we expect this to buy a function to equal 1, so we get the classical law of Dulong and Petit. And, and, and you can actually check that. In fact, you know, at high temperatures, what we said, we, we have to have this to uh, to equal 1, and, and, and you can do that. You can plug that in. You can do this integral, and you'll find exactly that it, when y goes to 0, that does equal 1, and so we're good. So let's just summarize. At low temperatures, again, as we argued earlier from our you know, sort of quick estimate, at low temperatures, we have beta times h bar omega is, is large at low temperatures because the temperature is getting small, so beta is getting large and this is dimensionless, it's much, much greater than 1. And we saw that uh, back because of this, well, let's go just go back to look at this. We saw back here that in that limit, this factor becomes small, and uh, this factor becomes this exponential, which means it's heavily weighted at low values of the frequency. Remember that? So, um, so only low frequency modes contribute, and so then only the dependence of this the by density of states at low frequencies is important. And remember, that's where it works best. That's where the Debye approximation works really, really well. And so in this limit, of course, as we argued before, we can replace the cutoff in that integral by infinity at low temperatures. And so the integral just becomes a constant. This integral just becomes a constant when y goes to infinity. And so as we saw before, uh, specific heat just goes like t to 3. In fact, we can evaluate the constant here. It's just this integral. And you find that uh, when this limit of integration goes to infinity, this integral just becomes another de well-known definite integral. It just becomes 4 pi to the 4th over 15. So that means now we have low temperature dependence of the specific heat. 
it's just some constant here, the 12 over 5 pi to the fourth times n k, k here being Boltzmann's constant, times the temperature divided by the divide temperature theta. That should be a subscript. Whoops, that should, I don't know how they got like that. Anyway, to the third power, we already saw it went like t to the 3. But now we have the, the constant. And we see then that this result from the Debye model is actually quite different to Einstein's model, Einstein model at low temperatures. I mean, they both go to zero at low temperatures, but they go to zero very differently. This goes to zero exponentially, and this goes like a power law. And that is the really nice result of uh, Debye and the Debye approximation, and the fact that it you don't have to know the real details uh, in this low temperature limit because um, that's where this approximation works really, really well. L long wavelengths, of course. So, of course, long wavelengths, you can't really see anything uh, left of the um, small features around um, distance scales of the lattice constant. And just to illustrate this, well, let me just say, this explained experimentally, so first of all, people noticed that Dulong Petit didn't work at low temperatures because it went to zero. The heat capacity in the measurements went to zero, and Einstein, on the basis of quantum mechanics and a very simple model for lattice vibrations, showed that he could explain that. But then, uh, when, when measurements got better, the actual manner in which the heat capacity went to zero um, was found experimentally to go like a power law instead of this exponential. And, and so Debye approximation really work for that. But if you study more advanced physics, you find that whenever you're studying, for example, the interaction of phonons with other modes, like electronic modes, then this Debye approximation is very, very useful. So you don't have to put in all these really myriad de details about the lattice. And so you'll see the Debye approximation used extensively. And in particular, it was used, for example, to, uh, to um, uh, study uh, for when BCS did the theory of superconductivity, they, they use this because in BCS model, the, the pairing is involves phonons, and so they use this Debye approximation quite successfully for that. So I'll just wind up by, we'll just look at a plot of these, and I'll show you what I, what I mean. So we can compare these two results graphically, and what I've done here is I've plotted the specific heat from the Einstein model, this dark blue curve down here, uh, and I've compared it to the result of the Debye model, which is this sort of reddish-orange curve here. And, I've, and for these two curves, I've chosen the Debye frequency to be equal to the, uh, or so the Debye temperature, which is basically um, uh, proportional to the uh, Debye frequency to be also the Einstein temperature. And you can see they're quite different here. That's, of course, because for Debye, we're, we're averaging over lots of uh, modes. But the point I want to make is in, in this other curve, this light blue curve, I've adjusted uh, the Einstein temperature or, or um, to, to be some around half the Debye temperature and to push this curve up. But the point I'm trying to make is that because the heat capacity due to Einstein is exponential, um, even if you adjust things to try to make them match somewhere up here, you're never going to make it match at low temperatures because something that goes to zero exponentially uh, is uh, with temperature in this manner is always going to go much faster at low temperature than a power law. So there's a huge difference between power law and exponential dependence at low temperature. And, and the measurements showed this power law. And of course, if we plotted this on a log uh, linear plot, we would, we would see, of course, the slope three. So that's the big result of the Debye model in terms of specific heat, and it was observed experimentally. And um, the message is that the Debye approximation works extremely well at low temperatures uh, for the arguments we've given. So that concludes uh, the lecture on uh, lattice vibrations, uh, phonons, and the specific heat of solids at low temperatures. And in fact, it's the last lecture of the course. So um, you'll have another, as I said at the beginning, you'll have another tutorial and a review session. And uh, 
Be sure to ask questions if there's something you need uh, more information on. Thanks again, and um, uh, thanks for this um, remote experience of lectures. I hope that it was okay for you, and uh, it'll be better uh, next term, I'm sure, since we're all getting used to this model of lectures. Anyway, um, see you next time.